So uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Thanks for putting my name next to uh, Richard Karp's name in the same uh, line. That's enough for me. Uh, we are a somewhat uh, intimate audience, uh, so let's just adjust instead of uh, 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 feeling negative about it. Uh, make feel, uh, you know, feel free to make it more interactive. Um, I did uh, kind of plan this talk to be high level and somewhat broad, but feel free to kind of grill me on questions. I may not have um, slides for it. And uh, also kind of a threat, if you don't do it, there's a chance that Ellie will ask a lot, a lot of questions. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yes, Ellie. Uh, you know, we'll find out during the talk, I guess. Cool. So uh, what we're going to talk about is this technology that's at the back end of uh, uh, blockchains and uh, cryptocurrencies. And really what it's about is uh, this ability to keep a ledger of you know, your uh, digital money your payment, you know, the withdrawals and the deposits. The same one that you currently have in the bank, presumably uh, most of you don't have all of your worldly assets in physical gold or in, you know, physical cash. Presumably it is already digital in some ledger. But the difference is this ledger is in some bank that you trust and uh, these banks, these institutions are centralized. And because they're centralized, uh, they've been somewhat stagnated in the technology that they uh, harbor. Um, not perhaps as efficient and modernized as we would like them. Not a lot of competition. There's a lot of rent that they extract out of their position of centralization. And so the idea is uh, that this technology will enable decentralizing these ledgers such that uh, we can open the platform for competition, more efficiency, and uh, you know, far, far greater uh, interoperability. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is take you through this uh, journey of about four decades of the technology behind this that enables the decentralization of the core of blockchains. So the journey starts here. Uh, many of you, if not all of you, uh, perhaps know this work. Um, and it's kind of a fascinating story, perhaps one of my uh, favorites. Um, so this is the work um, that uh, was done in the late 70s when NASA wanted to build a control system for its avionics uh, systems and uh, for spacecraft. And they realized that uh, there could be faults, there could be faulty hardware, there could be a sensor that has a faulty re uh, uh, reading. And so they built their control systems with three uh, replicas of all of their computers and sensors and a um, paradigm which used voting of two out of three, such that if one sensor went bad or some computer had a malfunction or a bug or something like that, then um, uh, by majority, the other two would, would actually uh, uh, drive the decision. So this seems to make sense, right? Um, but they didn't stop at that. Um, they went to the experts uh, in the field, a group of scientists at uh, SRI International, and uh, asked them to look at this design and verify that it is actually correct and will always be safe and there's always going to be uh, a uh, right decision. And this is, um, um, this is a, uh, an artwork taken from the paper this, this group of uh, scientists produced. And uh, the rest is history. Uh, again, one of my favorite stories. What this group of scientists showed is, first of all, the design was not safe. Secondly, they proved that it could never be safe with three computers in the settings and the hardware that uh, was available at the time. So they proved it was impossible. And thirdly, for good measure, they showed that with four computers, there is a solution and produced the, fourth, uh, the first solution uh, and the first algorithm that would actually work. And, um, and these foundations are the ones that we still carry till, uh, till today. They also uh, coined the term Byzantine failure to model these type of failures or malfunctions that cause these arbitrary behaviors. And what we see in this picture is uh, exactly that. You know, one of the components behaves arbitrarily, has a bad reading, but it doesn't stop there. It might actually tell one thing or send a message over the wire with one bit to uh, one participant and something else to another participant. And um, uh, this is uh, what's known in, as Byzantine uh, failures and Byzantine fault tolerance systems uh, till today. So fast forward uh, to uh, today's settings. Uh, in about uh, 2012, Bitcoin gave 
essentially the killer app for Byzantine fault tolerance. Um, so this idea of uh, maintaining a decentralized ledger of payments in a global uh, currency is the killer app that requires scalability and decentralization and this lack of trust in the participants. But it did not give a satisfying solution that could actually scale for global needs and could actually provide the serious, strong um, basis for really changing the way we do financial services. Um, so this caused um, institutions, enterprises, and uh, even banks and governments uh, to, again, do the same thing, go to the experts and um, uh, essentially accelerate the interest and the attention in this technology and uh, um, uh, encourage and foster uh, research and advances that would bring this technology to the scale and uh, the, the seriousness that we need it today. And so if there's one message that uh, you would take away from uh, this talk today is that, yes, blockchain in the past few years has really unlocked tremendous innovation, creativity, originality, and a lot, a lot of advances in the field. And specifically for the talk today, I want to go also a step beyond just hardening and just strengthening the technology so that it's more scalable and um, perhaps more robust, but also thinking about, OK, can we go beyond the known impossibility and resilience bounds. So yes, breaking and bypassing the known bounds for resilience. So this is the, the spoiler, and uh, hopefully um, uh, I'll deliver on some of it uh, uh, later on. The other takeaway is uh, that, uh, hey, if you're in the blockchain field, then you probably have job security for the next uh, year or two uh, uh, to work on these problems. And so, Focusing on this very problem of Byzantine fault tolerance, so decentralizing um, a, a uh, log that keeps the payments, uh, the his, uh, you know, payment history uh, of transactions. If you look at uh, the history, if you do a, a, a brief a snapshot at uh, the way it was developed, then um, initially. Um, it was uh, presented, as I said, in the setting of a control system of three or four uh, computers. And the first solution that was given uh, was uh, for real-time uh, networks and was meant really for that type of scale, for you know, three or four uh, participants. It took almost a decade for the community to develop the first solution that did not rely on synchronous networks, uh, and that was the DLS uh, solution. Uh, that was not a practical solution. It was mostly to show that it uh, was possible. Then it took another decade for the community to develop the first two-phase solution, uh, which was uh, practical and was also named the practical solution, um, uh, called PBFT. Then, for about a decade, um, uh, what happened was what I call uh, the lost decade of Byzantine fault tolerance, where the community kind of went the wrong, tr wrong track and looked for uh, you know, improved practicality, but actually with, with a, a flawed uh, basis. Um, and then it took more than a decade for this renewed interest stemming from the blockchain world. And in the past four or five years, we see tremendous progress where all of these solutions come together, um, you know, uh, flawed uh, foundations or, or problems in the foundations were addressed and scalability was driven all the way down to uh, you know, really scalable and really practical solutions. And this is a, um, sort of a brief history, and I'll go through it in a little bit more detail in a few more slides. Before I get there, I want to say this technology is, is relevant. It has a compelling use case. And um, at Facebook slash Calibra, We've actually announced uh, a few months ago um, that we're going to uh, that we plan to launch a platform that will drive financial services and um, uh, uh, will bring to the world uh, a digital currency that will allow interoperable financial services and payments over the platform. And the platform called Libra will be driven uh, by a blockchain. Obviously, Facebook is not uh, the only one, but this is a very uh, ambitious and uh, uh, real uh, project uh, with a grand and important mission uh, for uh, enhancing 
the way financial services and payments and people use them uh, in the world. Now, Libra uh, is different from many of the other blockchains out there in a number of uh, important ways. Um, Libra is a um, unit of accounting that is backed by a reserve. Uh, the precise composition of the reserve is still something that's uh, being determined. Uh, but essentially, it will be a non-fractional reserve, which will have a one-for-one -one backing for every unit of currency in a uh, basket of currencies or you know, the exact composition will be determined uh, that will be invested and kept um, um, by the Libra Association and managed such that the unit of currency will be a proxy for the reserve. Um, the Libra blockchain itself is meant to be interoperable and allow services to be implemented on top of it and allow transfers of Libras uh, among them. Now, the Libra blockchain itself is uh, designed among, uh, initially, the founding members of the Libra Association in a way that decentralizes the trust and such that no individual member, including um, uh, Facebook Calibra, which is the you know, uh, uh, designer and the, the, the uh, visionary behind this, um, none of, no, no single member, including Calibra, will have control. So this is a decentralized um, uh, a group of, of uh, um, uh, industries and of strong participants that will together uh, maintain and operate uh, this uh, blockchain platform. Over time, uh, the initial set of members uh, may grow and may open its participation uh, through mechanisms that will, uh, on the one hand, uh, allow dynamism, and on the other hand, will continue maintaining the guarantee of uh, decentralization. So this is the, of course. Yeah, so in fact, kind of this slide is the initial uh, uh, membership of the association that was established uh, exactly uh, uh, two or three uh, weeks ago. It has, uh, uh, as you know, 21 members. And uh, the current plan is to launch the blockchain with, uh, we still hope, uh, uh, about 100 uh, addition, you know, so there will be additional members. So the initial participation will be uh, fixed, uh, but there are definitely going to be uh, methods that will allow uh, additional members to apply and uh, to um, um, uh, rotate um, uh, their participation both in the association and in the blockchain. The exact details of them are still you know, subject of uh, the entire community's research as well as our own, and will be rolled out uh, by launch time. So, the, those are uh, great questions. Uh, so, the association is, first of all, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a nonprofit established in uh, uh, Switzerland whose role is to govern both the technology all the decisions about the design, um, as well as uh, the uh, decisions about the basket and uh, uh, the investment of all the uh, reserve uh, that backs this uh, blockchain and uh, um, uh, investment token that will be coupled with, with this technology. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the role of the association. Now, the initial members of the association, uh, the plan is for them also to be the ones that participate in the decentralized distributed protocol, and each one of them will host and operate a single node in this network that uh, uh, consists, you know, that, that uh, builds the blockchain platform. Down the line, um, these two might uh, diverge in certain ways. The uh, participation in the blockchain might become uh, more automated, but still governed by the Libra Association. I also want to uh, emphasize that as of three weeks ago, when the Libra Association has been established, um, anything that I can say about our thoughts in Calibra is subject to uh, finalization and consensus decision by the Libra Association. 
uh, Calibra is just one member at this point out of 21 and later out of 100. Yep. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, but I also want to mention these are also participating companies in the Libra Association and not just nodes in the blockchain technology. So from a technology point of view, the scalability um, uh, is planned to, to uh, um, be suitable for a much higher scale and dynamism. Yep. Um, so I can answer um, to some degree. Obviously, I'm not an economist. Uh, I have been in the blockchain field for a number of years now, uh, and so I've learned a lot about money uh, through this process, but I'm not an expert in uh, economics. Um, so what you're asking is, what is money? And that's a very good question. And uh, you know, Aristotle and uh, Plato have their answers, and uh, the Federal Reserve had its answer. Um, but assuming that you have faith in money in today's economies, whether it's the dollar in the US, whether it's the euro in Europe, uh, what Libra does is um, um, maintains a non-fractional reserve, an investment uh, of uh, whatever is used to buy Libras in a bank, uh, will not loan or use it in any fractional way, the way banks do. So it's not going to turn into a bank. It's a reserve. And provide you a digital representation, a proxy of every unit that's in the reserve uh, to handle digitally. So a layman's answer that I can give is think of it like a casino chip. You go, you give a dollar, you get a chip that says one dollar. And um, you know, if you think that a casino is um, uh, stable enough and will not go away and we'll always have enough dollars in the cash uh, one for one against those chips that it hands yes, out. You can always go back and the guarantee that the Libra yes, Association manifest we gives. There was not frack. Yes, so the, the guarantees in the economist's terms is that it's non-fractional not be used uh, to loan back and uh, to uh, gain interest on. OK. Um, and yeah, and I think, uh, again, these are exciting times. Uh, 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 this is David Marcus, the head of uh, Libra, uh, uh, in a deposition in front of the Congress. And I, uh, you know, there, there, there are many ways to look at this. The way I look at this is uh, there's very, very strong interest, very strong curiosity to catch up with the uh, uh, innovation and guarantee that there's regulation and regulatory oversights that <coughs> protects uh, our economy and our society, and at the same time, not stop innovation. And you know, there's some hurdles and uh, uh, questions and concerns and all sorts of uh, uh, interesting uh, um, uh, uh, evolutions uh, that will go in the, this process, but there's a lot of curiosity, uh, and uh, uh, at the end, innovation will win. So I just want to mention um, the distinction between Libra, which is both the association and the technology, and also the name of the uh, 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 token that's going to be uh, uh, launched, and Calibra, which is the company that pays my salary and also develops a uh, custodial wallet, uh, which will be one of the many services that uh, we expect uh, to launch and to make use of the platform. And uh, Calibra the wallet will be um, the service and the business and the product that Calibra the company will um, uh, operate. Yep? Sorry, so are these keys maintained by Calibra or by the reserve? Which keys? Are the private keys for? 
Um, so if you are going to be a customer of the Calibra wallet, then Calibra will establish an account for you, will KYC you and uh, 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 onboard you and maintain keys for you. But you will have the uh, option to uh, use the services of any other wallet that will launch on the platform. Cool. Um, shifting gears back to technology. So all of this goes back to the works of, you know, um, uh, the foundations uh, of Byzantine fault tolerance. So the nice thing about computer science and science in general is that we're able to take this very, very complex problem of financial services and uh, uh, payments and so forth and distill it to a very, very simple problem that if you solve it once, uh, you can build all of this technology on top of it. And this is what uh, you know, the Byzantine General's problem did for us. So the uh, problem you know, in one slide is um, there's a group of participants. We typically denote their number N, and we assume that some of them are not trusted, are corrupt, uh, and the term that uh, we use for them are Byzantine. And we usually denote them by F, you know, that's the threshold of uh, the Byzantine uh, participants. And what they want to do is reach agreement on just a single bit, zero or one. Once you solve that problem, you can repeatedly solve this problem and form an entire blockchain of blocks of transactions and contents and values uh, uh, by solving this uh, basic core. So to solve this basic core, um, let me spend uh, kind of a few minutes to give you uh, uh, sort of a consensus or Byzantine fault tolerance 101 on what you need to know if you were the CTO of a blockchain company and you need to um, uh, uh, make some decisions and uh, design the architecture and the core of your blockchain. So you already know, you know a very simple problem that you need to solve. The next thing that you uh, need to ask yourself is uh, what do you assume about the network? So the original network of a spacecraft was um, you know, very small. It was all in the cockpit of a single uh, spacecraft. And it was assumed that the communication was reliable and timely. And if you know, two computers were correct, um, then every message reached you know, the other computer in, in a known bounded time. So this is what we call synchronous network. And the original uh, solutions that was given under this setting was safe under this assumption. And under this assumption, the original solution showed that you can actually tolerate um, uh, up to a minority of the failures, assuming um, uh, digital signatures, assuming uh, public cryptography. Or if you don't assume public cryptography and the setting of the spacecraft did not have that, then you need uh, um, uh, to have more than, uh, or let me put it around, uh, the other way around, at most a third of the uh, participants uh, could be Byzantine faulty. And this is under the assumption that the network is synchronous. No matter what you do, these are the known uh, bounds. <laughs> Uh, also, they showed that under this setting, uh, if you have n participants, then you need, in a worst case uh, scenario, at least n synchronous rounds to reach a solution using this assumption of synchrony. And there's a lower bound that came much later um, that you need at least a quadratic number of messages to reach a solution. So all of these are well-known uh, bounds that were given all uh, along the years. And it's kind of, kind of discouraging when uh, you think about n this number, not as three or four, but as something that needs to grow to tens of thousands or maybe even millions of participants as per Shafi's uh, questions. So in the original setting, didn't uh, seem too bad, but uh, scaling is a challenge. Now, even more challenging is when you start thinking about uh, decentralized settings where the network may suffer periods of attacks or delays or disruptions or even partitions as in a wide area settings and doesn't have this reliable synchrony guarantee, and then the situation is even worse. So first of all, the problem is impossible to solve. So is there anybody in this very intimate audience that did not know this uh, simple fact? Oh, good. So I have one, uh, one person that took something out of the stock. So um, there's a well-known classical impossibility that says that under asynchronous settings, 
let me say this a little bit more precisely, it's not that it's a, a, uh, impossible, but there may always be a very unlucky uh, scenario in which repeatedly messages are dropped and delayed and prevent any algorithm that you decide from um, reaching a decision for arbitrarily long time. Most of the time it can behave well, but there is uh, provably always a very unlucky um, uh, scenario that will prevent uh, convergence. Um, no matter what you do, you need uh, 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 you can be resilient to a small, just a third faulty, even if you have digital signatures or no matter what. Um, and then the question is, um, how do you deal in practice with this uh, impossibility? So um, the most uh, um, uh, promising theoretical direction to do it is to try to quantify this very unlucky scenario in something that you um, uh, enforce in the algorithm. And uh, this is uh, the approach that uh, Ben Orr um, introduced, uh, where you introduce randomness into the algorithm and flip coins. And then this allows you to reason and to analyze about the, um, you know, the actual quantity, the actual probability of this unlucky scenario and uh, bound it so that it's uh, very unlikely to happen. And you know, it took the community uh, quite a long time. In fact, only this year we introduced a solution that using this randomized approach would meet a similar bounds to the synchronous setting. And in particular, we'll have n squared communication. And until now, until very recently, most of the protocols, uh, first of all, had a polynomial that was more than quadratic. And secondly, were quite complex. So for the most part, this was theory land. And Sorry. of course. <laughs> <laughs> sure. The order one expected, yes, but all of these properties jointly, so n squared communication um, with a trusted setup and order one expected uh, number of rounds, this is something that was only closed uh, this past year. Uh, they did not give n squared communication back then. Uh, polynomial, yes. Sorry, not n yes, uh, but not n squared. Sorry, and for modest number n, like hundreds, quadratic is potentially, you know, uh, feasible. Uh, n to the three, n to the four is already, you know. Just, just think of it, you know. Let's say it's a hundred, hundred participants, like the Libra Association. No, no, absolutely. Yes. No, they're always uh, here is actually very small. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a very, very abbreviated history. Uh, just highlighting, first of all, the first groundbreaking, um, you know, conceptual groundbreaking idea that showed that you can use randomization, and then fast forward to where we are today. So this is very, very abbreviated. This is also not the, so no, 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 no intention to, to kind of insult anybody. In the synchronous? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely, yeah. Pardon the naive question, but what does trusted setup mean? Yes, yeah, so a trusted setup means that uh, um, uh, parties are assigned keys uh, that they, they um, uh, or you know, some, some shared randomness or some shared keys uh, before they start that they, they all know of it, of, uh, uh, that they all know of. So some dealer, some trusted dealer, hands keys to everybody, not a global certification authority, but some dealer that uh, is setting up for <laughs> this particular set of end players, um, uh, shares a secret or shares a, a key among the participants. And you can do it once, and then you can apply this uh, solution again and again and again with a single trusted setup. But if you don't have that trusted setup, then um, there's no known solution with n squared. There are known solutions, but um, uh, the best one is n to the 5, some polynomial. Yep? The old school communication. Yep. 
the first was it's uh, for the deterministic algorithm, the deterministic algorithm, or it's for also for also for realistic algorithm. Um. It does not hold with randomization. I like to centralize. Uh, 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 the first time that I think of it, I like to centralize uh, domain. We don't have any anything in distributed about the relation between randomized distributed algorithm and deterministic. No implication in the de-randomization or anything like this. So I just wonder about the OS permutation. Whether this is just happened to be the AMS solution or the old square communication also holds for the square probabilistic? So order and squared communication holds for probabilistic. It also holds for synchronous setting. Um, and that was shown actually in the recent PODC for the synchronous setting. I'm not sure it holds for the synchronous setting with randomization. I think that's still open. I would have to check. No, 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 but this is a lower, uh, he's talking about the lower bound. So he's asking whether there's a lower bound of n squared communication on, uh, <coughs> on uh, randomized algorithms, and uh, I believe the answer is yes. One more question. So yeah? What set of means computational assumptions, your digital signatures, is that the issue? So I want to distinguish simply because uh, the normal assumption that we have in all of these uh, protocols is authenticated channels, point-to-point -point channels. Uh, without that, there's very little we can do. And that already also requires some kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, a global setup. That's not uh, the assumption. The assumption here is that there's actually a, a, a dealer that uh, shares a secret or a key among these end participants. So not just point-to-point uh, uh, -point, uh, authenticated channels. That's the standard assumption. No, there is. So, so these, these, this upper bound uh, does use trusted setup and uses uh, uh, computational, uh, you know, so crypto. Not same thing, right? You could have a trusted setup, like as in, uh, you could distribute a sequence. Yep. Yeah, and without computational assumption, what is the best random solution? It's probably those Feldman, Micali, old solutions. Oh, or, uh, yes. Um, but, so those, those are information yes. But I don't think they solve it with order one expected. No, they don't. They don't. I have no idea, but that's yeah, I don't think you can. I'm I'm very honored to be confused with Nkali, but this one is uh, is me. <laughs> cool. I don't mind spending all the lecture on this slide. I mean, so this is a very abbreviated uh, history of all synchronous solutions, all asynchronous solutions, all uh, you know uh, asynchronous uh, uh, randomized solutions. Clearly not the topic of this talk, but it's very very abbreviated uh, history. Just to kind of the takeaway message is to say this is a hard problem. <laughs> And uh, there's a lot of theory behind it that is not satisfying uh, for the kind of use cases that we need. And for good reasons. Uh, and, uh, there are lower bounds that say you can never do anything better. One last question, sorry. Yeah? But, uh, it has nothing to do with what So in terms of the authentication, that you're assuming authentication yep. going forward. So I, I, there is some work that talks about unauthenticated and sort of splitting the network into parts. Yeah, but that's very theoretical. I don't know what you can do in a network that you don't even know who you are talking to. And you can't distinguish. You have ports, and you can only distinguish between your left port and your right port. Uh, those are, you know. The reason I'm asking is because, you know, fast forwarding to the problem we're going to talk about today, yep. the assumption is a global, like, say, Yeah, the assumption is that we're, we're in the internet, and you have uh, IP, you know, uh, and TLS uh, on the internet, and you know who you're talking to, at the very least, yeah, for sure. Yeah, otherwise, we're really in theory land. How much, uh, how, f f for how long should I plan this for? An hour. An hour. Mm -hmm. Starting at 
for thir uh, for 15 or started starting at 4 <laughs> Okay, so I have. I've, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to fast forward and uh, not talk a lot about uh, what I came to talk about. But that's fine. Let me just very quickly say what happens with practical solutions. So I, I wanted to give a very uh, quick taste on why this is a hard problem and um, that we have solid foundations that indicate um, some some uh, resilience bounds. Um, um, but at the same time, we also have practical systems that are uh, built with Byzantine photons, and they take a different approach. And uh, the approach that they take is um, uh, to focus on uh, uh, a model we call partial synchrony, which guarantees safety at all times and waits for periods of synchrony uh, to make progress and kind of combines this asynchronous synchronous uh, approach. And this is a model that was um, uh, introduced and with a groundbreaking result by uh, Dwork Lynch uh, Stockmeyer, uh, both for standard crash failures and for these Byzantine failures. And um, the main value of this solution was really to show that it's possible to uh, 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 present a solution that works in this approach. And again, it always guarantees safety. You never reach conflicting decisions. But you may go through uh, arbitrary periods of time where you know, if the network doesn't behave as you expect, then you're um, uh, timing out prematurely and not making uh, any progress. The purpose of uh, this solution was not as a practical system uh, design. And in fact, it was polynomial with many, many rounds of communication. And at the end of the day, ex ex uh, uh, required some synchrony uh, in order to, uh, to make progress. Um, it took uh, the community 11 years for uh, Castro and Liskov to introduce a practical approach that focused uh, on a very um, um, kind of intuitive notion of a leader-based um, uh, scheme for solution. And the idea was uh, to go through some period of warm-up where perhaps there are failures or perhaps there are uh, even uh, premature timeouts, but eventually a stable leader in the network, one of the nodes in the network, will have stable communication, timely communication with everybody, and then it can repeatedly drive decisions very, very efficiently just by proposing the decision and having everybody accept that. And that was the uh, PBFT, practical uh, B, uh, uh, BFT approach. And those of you who were at Simon's um, uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, would have had the, you know, the privilege of hearing uh, uh, Barbara Liskov talk about uh, uh, the context in which this um, solution emerged. Um, so this solution is practical in the sense that it's uh, very, very fast and uh, very simple once a leader emerges. Uh, it has quadratic communication complexity in the common case. And every time the leader needs to be replaced, uh, there's a quadratic communication to replace the leader. And that can cascade, and in the worst case, it can cascade uh, uh, even under you know, synchronous and faultless conditions. It can uh, uh, cascade uh, order and times. So you get uh, or, uh, uh, n cubed communication complexity until you make progress. So again, this is practical for small ends, but not so practical for very large ends. Um, so then uh, uh, Kotla et al. Uh, introduced Ziziva. And Ziziva is the last word in the dictionary. So they gave their protocol uh, the last word in the dictionary, assuming this would be the last word in Byzantine fault tolerance. And what they do, did is take PBFT and add to it a fast track that was linear in the faultless common mode where a leader and everybody was uh, fail free. Uh, so they really optimized for the kind of uh, 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 best uh, conditions. And um, um, under more adversarial conditions, they fall back to PBFT, so n squared leader uh, change that could uh, uh, cascade and so forth. Unfortunately, this was also uh, uh, not a safe protocol, and this is something that uh, we've uh, uh, indicated at the community once we started looking for scalable solutions for uh, blockchains. And so um, uh, at VMware, with, with the team uh, of researchers that I worked with, we introduced a, a fix to their approach and also uh, combined it with you know, well-known uh, methods in uh, security protocols where uh, when 
a leader collects identical votes, identical messages from the network, it uses threshold crypto to combine these messages and thereby drive the communication down from uh, uh, n squared to uh, uh, linear. And linear is really the best you can hope for when you want to drive any kind of agreement. The very least you have to do is send a message about the decision to everybody. So the linear is really the best you can hope for. Um, and in this solution called SBFT, um, um, uh, the common mode was linear, but a leader replacement still inherited the DLS and then the PBFT and then the ZZIVA uh, approach uh, that is quadratic. And again, that can, um, um, that can cascade and cause uh, n to the three uh, uh, communication cost. Uh, and so finally, um, um, the, the date is wrong here, but uh, uh, last year we introduced uh, Hot Stuff, which is uh, um, an approach that takes all of these advances together and combines them and produces a, a solution that has linear communication in all these scenarios, both the common mode and the leader replacement. And um, the other nice thing about Hot Stuff is that you would think that with all these advances and all this theory, we came up with a very, very complex protocol with a lot, a lot of corner cases and uh, so forth. But actually, um, uh, this was a, a, a very simple protocol. In fact, it's so simple that I've attempted to put it on one slide, but since I'm so, so, so far behind schedule, I won't go through the details. You can actually explain this protocol in one slide. Very simple, very f uh, developer friendly uh, to implement. And um, uh, in fact, Calibra uh, 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 is developing its uh, core, uh, its blockchain core around this protocol, as do other companies. This is what this is where we use threshold crypto and combine and aggregate signatures. So we aggregate n signatures into one, and we never do this uh, counting. So when we say n order n, it's really order n. It's order n messages of constant size. I mean constant up to the fact that you have counters that are you know theoretically not bounded, but uh, it is constant. Oh yeah. It is. Yes. 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 That's an expectation? No, that's worst case. Uh, and the people that I talk to, I don't know. And by the way, there's no, there's no randomization here. This is deterministic. There's no randomization here. This is a term, deterministic protocol. Yeah. By, by synchronous. Yes. It's for the partially synchronous setting. It doesn't use randomization to overcome uh, asynchrony. It uses uh, optimism. It may go through a period where you don't make progress if the network is under attack or you know, uh, go through these asynchronous periods. It guarantees progress as soon as a leader, a stable leader, emerges. The same practical approach as PBFT and DLS and so forth. The same one as uh, Paxos, the same one that underlies wherever you keep your mail in the clouds these days for reliability, for application, all of these uh, mechanisms essentially use partial synchrony. Um, this is the, the approach that underlies all replication but, but the systems. Between, uh, well? No, no. The, the threshold crypto, yeah, that does have this. Uh, there's no randomization except, you know, in, in uh, uh, determining keys, but uh, the guarantee is probabilistic uh, under the uh, suitable cryptographic assumptions. The protocol itself does not have any coin uh, tossing and does not use randomization to drive um, con um, decision in all of these uh, lines of code. So uh, one thing that we've added uh, when taking this protocol to production is uh, liveness. And um, um, in the original hot stuff uh, technology, uh, there was no explicit mechanism for uh, driving liveness. And the naive way of doing it would, would again uh, creep in uh, quadratic communication. 
And uh, in Libra, this is done with linear communication in uh, the common mode. Mike? So the leader of every round uh, suffers the load of uh, collecting messages, combining them uh, for uh, thresholding and broadcasting back. But the leader rotates in each and every round. So unlike previous protocols, where leader replacement was this heavy, costly uh, operation that you wanted to avoid, um, here, this protocol looks like a blockchain. And it is much more like a blockchain in the sense that in every round, Somebody becomes a leader, proposes a proposal, and the next leader collects votes and aggregates them, and again, broadcasts a new proposal. So, and if you get up to billions, that's going to be interesting. So, is there any, is there a lower bound there, or could you envision a protocol where everybody has a constant amount of communication and it's over and out for all per um, So, again, if you actually want everybody to learn the decision, at the very least, you have to pay order in. Doesn't matter how uh, uh, yeah. efficient the, the Yeah, so if you, if you um, are looking for a mechanism where even the leader of a round does not incur you know, a linear um, cost, then there are actually folks who are working on it. Um, there was a, uh, uh, a nice talk at uh, Simon's uh, last week by uh, the Cello folks. Cello folks. Um, I forgot his name, but uh, they were working on an implementation of hot stuff that does the aggregation along a tree. They call it a BF tree, and the T is BFT. And and um, very interesting uh, mechanism. And there are others who are working on aggregating along a, an aggregation overlay um, structure that also combines the signatures uh, um, um, gradually along the network, kind of incrementally, so that there's no single member that is tasked with aggregating everything, even uh, uh, across a single round. Um, my own view is that the way you scale to billions of users is, or bi billions of participants is probably different. Wait, just to mention one thing. Yep. So there is a, a company in, in, in the finance and the cost of this multiplier computation, which is called uh, Communication Mortality, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a little bit related to what Mike is saying, where you want every, uh, yeah, every user to only perform it on the amount of users. Mm -hmm. So, right. So, so I would do that. I would probably do that in protocols like this as a communication substrate. So, I would say, you know, logically, I want to broadcast a message to everybody. Doesn't mean I actually have to send a point-to-point -point TCP message to each and every one. But I have a, uh, and in fact, this is the way you know blockchain networks are deployed. They're deployed over a gossip network, where each member is connected to some number. Logarithmic is enough. And so you pay by you know, a, a few hops, uh, probably no more than a logarithmic number of hops to reach everybody. Um, but I would encapsulate all of that in a communication substrate. And at the level of these algorithms, I would just say, OK, there's in-cast and broadcast. And how it's implemented is probably um, uh, its own kind of a, a module. Uh, it, it wouldn't change the fundamentals of the protocol. It would just uh, um, change the way it's implemented. I, I don't see any reason to build this into the protocols. The communication substrate, to me, it says that this is the people I, I can communicate. Whereas um, the reality is that that's a, I'm just going to farm it on myself, and I don't communicate with more than these many people. I mean, the trade off would be that I cannot mm, uh, make any uh, fault tolerance, any resilience guarantees under these models that are um, resilient, uh, resilient against uh, um, very uh, uh, adaptive adversary. These will, no, these will be probabilistic assumptions, right? By, by assumption. Yes. Right. Um, right. So uh, from a theory point of view, yes, there are protocols that do that. And they're very interesting. From a, um, a practical point of view, um, I have yet to see a system 
you know, even of uh, thousands of uh, uh, endpoints where this is really a problem, you know, sending uh, a few thousand messages for, for one node. Um, that's not solved with assumptions, but yeah. Um, it's a good point, and there are a lot of advances in the last one or two years also in the randomized uh, uh, protocols arena. Uh, those are really also very accelerated in the last two, three years, because we before the protocols were polynomials with a fairly um, kind of unattractive uh, degree, and they were also complex. And I really want to emphasize, I kind of have two hats here. The, the engineering hat and the theory hat. I really want to emphasize the right uh, side here. Um, if you want to give a very, very complex theoretical protocol for engineers to build and maintain and debug and trust the world economy or you know, financial services on it, uh, good luck. Uh, they really need something uh, very, very robust. And the simpler, uh, the more robust uh, the implementation is. Uh, I don't So in this arena, and this again is the um, wisdom that uh, holds not just in the blockchain and Byzantine world, but also in the crash model and underlies all of our uh, you know, data center, storage systems, Cassandra, all, all of them, you know, all of them based on Paxos or view stamp verification or etcd or Zookeeper, you know, all of these systems um, designed, you know, for standard benign failures. Um, the primary backup uh, intuition seemed to be the simplest, where really everything is driven by one primary, um, replicating state or commands to the backups, and that does seem to be the simplest core. Unfortunately, a leader-based or a primary-based protocol is inherently not randomizable and not, um, uh, not asynchronous. So you need to time out because you're waiting for this leader. What are you going to do? You need to apply timeout. As soon as you're applying timeout, it's not a, an async, a purely asynchronous protocol. It's not symmetrical. Um, this is not a theoretical kind of a, a, a rigorous answer. This is my best intuition from dealing with reliable systems for 20 years. They're all built in a primary backup paradigm, and that's the simplest way to drive these uh, systems. I don't know. Does anybody else have uh, opinions on it? All right. Um, let's see. I have a few minutes. Let's see if I, uh, if I want to say anything out of the flexibility. Um, work. So let me just um, kind of advertise uh, uh, an approach that really goes uh, uh, beyond. So I kind of uh, spent an hour, almost an hour, talking about the journey of four decades of Byzantine fault tolerance, its relevance to blockchains, uh, some of the uh, vision, very ambitious and very uh, uh, compelling vision that we have in this field uh, uh, and that, that Libra is, uh, you know, is now uh, promoting. Um, and sort of uh, what I won't have time today is to talk about, uh, okay, but what, what, what do we do when something goes wrong? I mean, these are uh, technologies that are going to drive very, very serious services. Just like the spacecraft, you know, mission critical uh, uh, setting, uh, this is going to be mission critical, but at scale and at far more adversarial situations and, you know, the wild uh, internet. So we have these assumptions. They're really nice for writing theory papers. No more than a third are faulty, you know, synchronous, asynchronous, all of this. What happens when something does go wrong? So this is what keeps us uh, uh, up at night. Can we go? beyond the current approaches and current resilience bounds and current limitations 
not just in terms of resilience and uh, uh, scalability, but also in terms of safety? And the answer is yes. And so in a paper that's uh, about to uh, be presented next week at uh, ACMCCS, we we're talking about flexible Byzantine fault tolerance. And um, uh, the approach has two ingredients. One is um, the introduction of a new fault model that allows us not to break any impossibility results. We don't do that. We don't violate. But to uh, bypass them and uh, really go uh, higher than any known resilience bounds, both in the synchronous and in the asynchronous setting, and combined. And how do we do this? Uh, so we do this by looking at the failure model and uh, realizing that it's perhaps not always relevant to think about the same failure model that you know, NASA uh, used when it designed a uh, control system for its avionics uh, um, 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 uh, control. Um, and in particular, Byzantine failures, which capture the worst case uh, failures, are not really the worst case and are not really what we want to always necessarily design for. So when we're talking about blockchains, um, uh, operating in an association of 100 of some of the strongest companies in the industry. These are companies that operate services 24-7. They do not crash. They do not become in, unavailable. Uh, maybe even uh, some synchrony can be guaranteed. Certainly, if I say a message will arrive within 10 days, that seems like a synchronous bound that will be hard to break in these systems. Um, at the same time, what we do know that happens in these systems is, first of all, there's huge economical incentive to cheat now, because these will be the platforms and the basis of financial services. Secondly, uh, any system that's deployed uh, uh, online, uh, almost uh, out there, has been at some point broken and secrets were stolen, or sometimes it's an insider attack. So sometimes what you have is that secrets or keys may get compromised, but the systems will not. So all of that means is that um, liveness is not so much a problem. Okay? It's, uh, uh, actually, the easy part is to guarantee liveness, but guaranteeing safety and security is the difficult part. Once you have that realization and break away from the assumption that uh, crash is the worst thing that can happen to you and you know, prevent progress, um, then you, you, you can get stronger resilience uh, bounds uh, and, again, combine synchrony and asynchrony. And the second thing that you realize is that um, systems were built with a single design point in mind. So you pick synchronous, asynchronous, or you pick randomized, random. You, know, you pick one of these parameters, and that's it. The system is fixed. But in a real uh, setting, we may want more um, diversity in our approach. Uh, for example, there may be transactions that are $5 uh, coffee at a Starbucks that we don't need extremely paranoid assurance levels for. And then there are uh, transactions that are, I don't know, buying or selling a house that we need higher assurance for. We may want um, uh, to change our assumptions based on what we observe in the network. If the network is under attack, we may want to, may want to change and adjust our assurance levels. So this is the diversity that we build into the mechanism. And so with flexible Byzantine fault tolerance, we uh, are able to do both. We're able to, in one uh, solution, bring stronger resilience as well as diverse, diversified uh, assurance levels. And unfortunately, I won't have time uh, to talk about any of it um, today. Uh, but let me just say that uh, Flexible BFT is a joint work uh, with uh, uh, Kartik Nayak and Ling Ren, uh, who are my postdocs at uh, VMware Research. And finish off with what I've started. Um, and sort of say the main takeaway is uh, there's still a lot, a lot of uh, attention and a lot of drive um, where companies, enterprises, uh, governments, federal banks, uh, they're all going to the experts and uh, want to advance this technology. And we at Calibra are committed to advancing the technology and to um, uh, working on uh, the challenges and uh, um, uh, opportunities that still remain. We're also hiring. And uh, with this, I'll thank you. <laughs> Well,
More questions? This was a very good discussion. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so let me just flash maybe one slide about the model. So the way, you know, uh, one of the ingredients uh, in, in this uh, flexible approach is uh, what we call alive but corrupt faults, or in short, it's ABC faults. And uh, what this model is, is um, you know, uh, uh, situations like the one you're talking about, Shafi, but also like the one where your keys are stolen. So you're still up, you're participating in the protocol, you're not going to uh, prevent uh, progress by not participating, but there's also a uh, uh, an, uh, um, uh, hacker out there that has your keys and might try to rush and send messages on your behalf or cheat or, you know, double spend uh, the the... Uh, balance that you have. So all of these uh, scenarios are modeled by ABC, alive but corrupt failures, where crashes are actually the more severe type of failures that we don't expect to happen. Okay, availability is guaranteed, but corruption, you know, this, this, uh, uh, any behavior that uh, deviates from the prescribed protocol is expected to happen. And with ABC faults, um, you can break away from these uh, known uh, resilience bounds. So the yes. Mm -hmm. So again, think of a, a scenario where your key, your secret key is stolen. You're not going to stop because of that. You you are still contributing to the protocol. You're still participating. But there might also be a, an attacker that every once in a while will try to uh, pretend uh, um, uh, and send messages on your behalf. And to the rest of the network, there's no difference between you or your key. So your behavior looks corrupt, but you're not attacking the liveness of the protocol. You're only attacking the safety of the protocol. So these are ABC uh, failures. You mean that a reason team can do whatever it wants to the message, but you cannot drop the message? Yes, precisely. And the other ingredient, since you're asking, a risk going through some of my talk anyway. Um, yep. Up to two thirds. Yeah. So the other ingredient is a completely new protocol, which um, removes any um, um, synchronous bounds from the protocol. So a typical protocol, like the one you have on the left, uh, has you know some some synchronous assumptions built into the protocol and works in kind of synchronous uh, uh, rounds. And uh, our protocol, which is also uh, quite simple does not have any steps that have synchronous bounds in the protocol. Only the decision, uh, um, which is concluded by, by the observer of the protocol that looks at the transcripts of the protocol, only that uses these synchronous bounds. Okay, so there's, there's um, no uh, assumption and no parameter built into the protocol on the uh, resilience bound or uh, the synchronous, synchronous bounds. So to your question, Ali, uh, just want to maybe flesh out what resilience bounds do we get. So with a particular choice of parameters in this protocol, what you can get is a combination of Byzantine and total number of corruptions that breaks away from um, uh, the normal uh, bounds. So with the normal bounds, so the gray area here is uh, the number of Byzantine protocol, uh, number of Byzantine uh, faults, and anything in the gray area is impossible under uh, this line because obviously you cannot have total number of faults that's less than the Byzantine number of faults. But usually for um, um, for synchronous for asynchronous solution, what you have is um, uh, at most a third resilience bound, and what you get with a flexible BFT is for synchronous assumptions 
if anybody waits outside the protocol, observes the transcript of the protocol, not a single protocol that solves for everybody, but if everybody outside the protocol observes and waits for you know, whatever duration uh, it decides, it can get to any combination of uh, uh, this uh, uh, green square. So essentially what it gets is this upper uh, right corner. There's no reason to, uh, uh, you know, there's no trade-off. And for asynchronous assumptions, what you get is this uh, orange-looking uh, uh, curve where the, the less Byzantine faults uh, occur, the higher the total number of corruptions that you can tolerate, up to two-thirds. And this is with this particular choice of parameters. Um, we can instantiate the flexible BFT protocol with different choices of parameters and then, then get these trade-off curves uh, you know, with different uh, bounds here, and the synchronous ones are uh, these points. Maybe we should have, uh, I don't know, a, uh, uh, an informal chat about this at some point uh, offline. All right, thanks. Thank